excited. So it's great to see you all here, and it's because of the quality of the event you've got ahead of you. We are delighted at Resolution to be working in partnership with the Society of Professional Economists. Um, we love working with them on the launch of exciting and important books on economics and economic policy, and this is certainly one of them. So you're going to hear from Howard Davis about his book. George Osborne is here, which is fantastic, and the event will uh, as well be chaired by Stephanie Flanders. Stephanie, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I am interested that this is, of course, this subject has got lots of people out. Um, and I know there's lots of people uh, online as well. Um, when you look at uh, British history since the modern treasury was invented, I guess by William Gladstone, although we might hear um, more from that later. Um, there's two sort of obvious conclusions that are often made. You know, one is that successful chancellors very rarely get to be prime ministers, certainly get to be, very oh, rarely right. get to be successful <laughs> prime ministers. <laughs> We even have an example of that here, potentially. <laughs> and actually, Winston Churchill is the example of the successful prime minister who was a chancellor, but he was a terrible chancellor. And he also only got to be prime minister when most of the people who remembered him being at number 11 were actually dead. <laughs> so he'd, been, he'd been chancellor in 1886, I think. Um, the second observation, there are only two, is that when you look at pretty much every major wrong turn of the modern era in the UK, it was almost always the Treasury's fault. <laughs> and when it isn't the Treasury's fault, it's invariably the Chancellor's fault. So that makes this administration particularly interesting. I think historians who are writing future books will marvel at how this administration has managed to screw up so spectacularly without any help from number, ten, from number <laughs> 11 at all. Um, but it does all make, all of this makes it a very good time to write and read a book about the chancellors and try and learn some lessons. And so Howard Davies is obviously a very good person um, to, to hear from on that subject, having run or helped to run most of the major institutions, many of the major institutions of British economic life. He's now chairman of NatWest, but obviously had been a deputy governor of the Bank of England and head of the FSA. Um, Howard's gonna talk for a few minutes about his book. George Osborne, who you see here and we've already discussed. <laughs> it's an, an example of uh, a former Chancellor of the Exchequer who uh, yeah, didn't become Prime Minister but went on to be editor of the Evening Standard and many other things. Uh, he's going to say... Well, the football club today. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's going to say whatever he feels like for, I think, a few minutes. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking at the questions on Slido, which you can uh, put, put on that on Slido. Um, but we will also, and it's hashtag Chancellor's Tales, I see. Um, but because we have a really distinguished audience here, uh, we will also be taking in-person questions after a certain point. But I, if you do questions on Slido, then I'll be able to sort of incorporate them in the discussion after both of the speakers have, have said a few words. So, Howard, over okay, to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. And thanks to uh, David and the Resolution Foundation and uh, SPE for organizing this um, and uh, uh, both the discussion but also I gather there's a work event um, afterwards um, <laughs> for people to take part in. Um, there are, uh, uh, I'm surprised that uh, there aren't more people actually but in fact there's a queue outside but they've all got fake tickets so um, <laughs> they can't get in. Um, but it's very uh, nice and appropriate that uh, David should be hosting here because uh, in 1982, he took over my job in the Treasury. I was then grandly entitled Principal Monetary Policy, uh, and I left for pastures new to go to McKinsey for a while, and uh, David uh, took over. Uh, at that time, he was a very promising young man who was walking out with a young woman who subsequently became a Labour MP. And if David uh, tries any cheeky questions, there's more stuff where that came from, David. Uh, so be careful. Um, now, the genesis of this book uh, was that when I was director of the LSE, um, I had uh, what I think was quite a bright idea at the time, which was to invite all the then extant chancellors, which went from Healy um, through uh, to Ken Clark, uh, 
uh, five of them were all uh, alive, to lecture at the LSE about running the Treasury. So not just about you know, the sort of ups and downs of the British economy during that period, but about the challenge of running the institution. And they all agreed, and they all came along, and both uh, Geoffrey and Nigel delivered uh, very dense uh, lectures, and Dennis Healy and Ken Clark told a few jokes, but that was fine, and I sort of stitched the story together with a fairly lengthy uh, introduction, and that was called The Chancellor's Tales. And so if people go and buy The Chancellor's Tales now, I'm quite happy for them to do so, but it is 20 years old. So uh, I thought when lockdown happened that uh, I needed to have something to do, really, and um, so I thought maybe I could do the same thing again, but obviously I didn't have a university. I mislaid that, that university along the way, um, uh, but I did find that the chancellors were kind enough to spare a bit of time on Zoom reflecting on their period and also quite a few other people, permanent secretaries and other officials uh, as well. So that's the source material uh, for the book. Uh, it's not a polemic um, and it's, I think, fundamentally sympathetic uh, to the Treasury. I've always thought that the Treasury is the only place in government that looks at both sides of the P&L um, and uh, is therefore absolutely crucial. And my aim was, as much as anything, to let the Treasury tell its own story. Indeed, I suggested to the publishers that the subtitle should be what did the Treasury think it was doing? But they said, well, it could be read as what did the Treasury think it was doing? So uh, perhaps that was a bit ambiguous. So that we ended up with something slightly uh, different. Uh, and also, I thought slightly unusually to, that it would be more interesting and make it slightly more readable to inject a little bit of my personal uh, history uh, in it. And so I, there is an element of that famous Spike Milligan book, Hitler, My Part in His Downfall, which is because I was rather a walk-on part most of the time, occasionally with the odd line, uh, but often not. Uh, but I did find that talking about the Treasury from the perspective of someone working in it and working alongside it at the Audit Commission, working alongside it uh, at the uh, Bank of England, uh, and then on doing things like the Airports Commission project where I interacted with the Treasury a lot, uh, that I had quite a number of different perspectives on the, on the institution. So what I want to do uh, this evening is just to talk about four uh, conclusions that I reached in the writing of the book, uh, but the, there's plenty of other things uh, in it. It's rather characteristic. The Treasury has never been exactly a marketing institution. Um, Although it does now have a flag, I have discovered, as the Chancellor, the current Chancellor, is frequently photographed in front of a Treasury flag, something that was not known, I think, in our day, David. Um, but anyway, there, there aren't copies of the book sitting around here, but this is it, uh, and you can buy it on Amazon or Blackwells or wherever. Um, uh, it, is, it was published, actually, on, on Friday, so it is now available. So my four points, um, really, the first one is about the sort of shape uh, of the Treasury and indeed and its reach. And I have to say that I thought when I began to write this that I would conclude that the continental, the more typical continental European model of a Ministry of Finance and a Ministry of Economy um, would commend itself to me and that as I went through the story that's where I would probably uh, come out. Of course, it was tried in the 1960s, the Department of Economic Affairs, with George Brown and, and Sam Britton and, and others. Uh, but it, that failure, I think, buried the idea uh, for 30 years. So in my Chancellor's Tales book, which was running from 74 to 97, it really didn't come up that much because the DEA had killed that notion. But this time, uh, through this period, it's come up a number of times. Um, there was the oddly named Project Teddy Bear, uh, which was under Tony Blair, run by John Burt, rather oddly, which conceived of a, of a split uh, in the Treasury. Gordon told me he'd never heard of it 
um, which I don't think should be taken totally <laughs> literally, uh, but I think you can see what he, what he meant. But that was uh, quite a live project in number 10 uh, for a year or so. Um, Gordon himself um, tried a slightly different tack, more of a personal thing, where at one point he wanted to move Nick McPherson uh, in out of the Treasury and somehow run a lot of the Treasury from number 10. And of course, Shruti Vadira uh, was working with him as well. So he was uh, flirting with creating a separate power base in number 10 and taking over some power from the Treasury, having left it, of course. Um, more recently, uh, Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill uh, had a good go um, at carving up the Treasury. That was tied up with their views on uh, Brexit and uh, Phil Hammond. Um, and that um, failed, but it was, as some Treasury people have said to me, a rather bad period from the Treasury where they did feel that, them, that they were significantly under attack. And then even more recently, um, Dominic Cummings. I mean, if you find, you can find on his smokestack or substack or whatever it is, um, he says, hey, the HM Treasury should be broken up. This was on our to-do list, and a lot of the deep state would Robert, cheer. If you want a prime minister who can truly govern rather than the media entertainment service model post-Thatcher, there's no alternative. Now, all of these people have had a go at the Treasury, and Gus O'Donnell, uh, to whom I talked quite at length, pointed out to me that all of these had come from the same source, that all of them had actually come from number 10, um, and that they were all attempts by the Prime Minister to break up the one rival sense, centre of power. Um, and that in Gus's view, having been both in the Treasury and in the Cabinet Office, that it was very important that we maintain this rival centre of power because we have a constitution which can deliver you an elective dictatorship um, in number 10, and without a rival centre of power in the Treasury, um, then the thing can go quite seriously wrong. So frankly, at the end of this, I changed my mind. But clearly, this is still a live issue in some people's minds, and I'd be interested in people's views on that. Second point um, is the Treasury and referenda. Uh, we've slightly forgotten about these things, and I'm, but I'm sure George will have a view on this. And I talk in the book, I have a chapter on the Scottish referendum and the chapter on the EU referendum. And in the Scottish referendum, um, as Alistair Darling said, the Treasury played a blinder. And that was Alistair commenting on George's Treasury. So that was a cross-party agreement, if you like. And that the uh, Treasury's policies are papers on the problem of the Scottish currency um, were extremely influential. And there's quite a lot of evidence that in the later stages of the campaign, voters changed their minds, particularly younger women voters, actually, um, because they were concerned about just who was going to run the economy and what their currency was going to be and regarded this as very uh, risky. Um, and that appeared to swing it. Gordon Brown thinks the opposite. Gordon Brown thinks that what swung the referendum campaign was his vow, if you remember, uh, to, the, to the Scottish people. But I have to say that as between Gordon and Alistair on this particular question, it seems to me that Alistair has it uh, and that the polling evidence is quite conclusive that the economic arguments and the papers produced by the Treasury, many of them written more or less entirely by Nick McPherson, did have a major impact on the vote. So the Treasury, in my view, clearly triumphed in the Scottish wars. But when it came to the continental European campaign, um, uh, there was rather a different outcome. <coughs> and it's an interesting question as to whether the Treasury was excessively emboldened by its success in the Scottish Wars to think that the similar tactic would work in the Brexit referendum. But then, of course, it was dubbed as Project Fear. In fact, terminology coined originally uh, by uh, Alex Salmond. Um, and the question I think one has to ask is, were these blood-curdling warnings about what would happen to the economy after Brexit a mistake? 
uh, and did it in fact have a contrary effect to the one that the Treasury succeeded in with, I think, um, in the Scottish referendum? Or was it simply that the question in the Brexit referendum had much more complicated emotional dimensions where this kind of rational argument was not uh, successful? I think the jury is still out on that, but it certainly, you can't say that the Treasury succeeded in the European referendum in the way that it has done in the Scottish one. I'd be very interested in George's perspective on this. Of course, he was opposed to the, having the referendum in the first place anyway, so uh, he was fighting a battle which he didn't wish to fight on uh, territory which he thought was inappropriate to fight it on, but it does appear that the Treasury lost that one. The third point, um, which I think has uh, become rather relevant again in the last week or so, um, is about the tax system. And one thing one is struck by over this period is a growing consensus that the tax system is a mess, uh, but a parallel view that nothing can ever be done about it. Um, George himself started with an ambition to simplify Tolly's handbook, um, which uh, was, I think, not uh, successful. Um, and the Tolly's handbook has recently grown even longer, uh, and the latest changes to taxation of energy make it almost impenetrably complicated, I think. Um, it seems there was the Merleys report, somewhat forgotten and buried now, but a very persuasive document um, which did lay bare the oddities and complexities of our tax system. But there seemed to have been in the Treasury really no appetite for serious change. There was an appetite for taking over some parts of the revenue, which Gus O'Donnell did a report on uh, for Gordon, and which shifted the balance of tax policy expertise from the revenue into the, uh, into the Treasury. But not much evidence that the Treasury, having taken that on, uh, has taken a strategic view about how to change the system. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a risk of losing revenue streams that are winners and losers. And if you ask the chancellors about this, essentially, their view is, look, the winners uh, will never thank us and the losers will complain bitterly. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to do anything simplifying and more rational of the tax system unless you're prepared to lose some money in the process. Um, and uh, in order to buy off uh, the losers, um, which is probably necessary to produce a more rational system. There's also a view that if it ain't broke, uh, don't bother with it. Uh, Gus O'Donnell put this rather well, I think, which is that his advice to chancellors in the tax system was don't just do something, stand there, um, which may be right. Uh, but two observations struck me and which left me rather anxious about this issue. McPherson, uh, Nick McPherson has said uh, in a lecture, rather important lecture, I think in 2014, that if you look over a long period of time, the tax take varies remarkably little as a percentage of GDP. And the whole period is between sort of 33 and 36 percent. Um, now we're towards the top end of that. Andrew Turnbull uh, said to me that the population here wants Northern European public services now, but are not prepared to pay for them. Um, we've got now the slightly odd situation of a chancellor who proclaims that he is a tax cutter, uh, but in the particular sense of a tax raiser, I think. Um, and we now have, I think, a rather awkward situation where we do, with a government committed to levelling up and to uh, public spending on all kinds of things, and as long as it's not in London, um, where it's not clear where the additional revenue can come from. And governments have committed themselves against raising the most obvious taxes. So you can't raise the basic rate and you can't raise uh, VAT. And therefore, you have to work around these two large sources of income if you want to raise any tax revenue. This strikes me as being um, a mess and a source of continued confusion. And I do feel at the end that I felt the Treasury had not covered itself with glory in the tax system and had tended to avoid any attempts at um, reforming the system in a meaningful way. Fourth and uh, last point, I might 
poses a question is, is the Treasury now hollowed out? I read, I, I was looking for literary references in, to the Treasury, and um, they are few and far between. The Treasury has inspired few novelists. Um, <laughs> one, curiously, which I don't recommend to you exactly, because it's really a bad novel, um, was by Alec Waugh, you know, Evelyn Waugh's brother, called A Spy in the Family. Has anyone from the Treasury ever read this book? It's in the, um, written in the early 60s, and, the no and it's about a Treasury um, official. And this Treasury official um, works meaningfully uh, in the morning, but goes off relatively early for lunch, always has um, his hands manicured at Simpsons, um, eats lunch in the Athenaeum, and he and his wife entertain lavishly at a large house in Kensington. He is not positioned as having a private income. This is all done on his treasury salary. It is not quite like that uh, these days and hasn't been uh, for a while. Interestingly, if you're interested in a really, really good novel about a ministry of finance, um, I can say with all the authority of someone who once chaired the Booker Prize and now chairs the London Library. The greatest novelist writing today is Michel Houellebecq, um, the French novelist. Anybody read Michel Houellebecq? Mm -hmm. Disappointing. Anyway, <laughs> he's written several really good books, but his latest one, which sadly isn't yet translated into English, is called Anéantir, Annihilate, uh, which um, is... I can, won't explain why it's called that. But the main character is a French treasury official called Paul Raison, Reason, you know, which is, of course, the rational man, as the tre a treasury official ought to be. And clearly, that's his idea. I have to say, I found it slightly spooky because his wife is called Prudence, which is the wife name of my wife, um, which was slightly strange. But anyway, a lot of it is set in Bercy, and it's sort of Le Maire is a, is a character in it. But actually, it conveys very interestingly um, the way it is to be in the Treasury. However, I uh, digress. Um, the uh, question really is uh, whether the Treasury can, is able to cope with the burden put on it now. John Kingman, for example, um, has did a lecture on this about four years ago, I think. And he basically thinks that the Treasury's hair shirt approach to staffing and the government's hair shirt approach to public sector pay together um, have put the Treasury in a position where it is significantly weakened um, and may well not be up to the task. He points out that um, in 1970, the average... London House cost 1.2 times a grade 7 Treasury salary, um, which I guess was principal in our day, David, but that was 1.2 times in 1970, and that when he did this speech, which I think was in 2019, um, at that point it was 8.4 times. The average London House price was 8.4 times the average Treasury salary for a grade 7. And that's a very, very um, worrying trend. And Kingman's view is, you know, we're getting to the point at which the Treasury can't really staff itself uh, in a way that it, it used to do. However, uh, Charles Roxburgh, for example, who's in the Treasury now, thinks that it's still up to the task. And indeed, the COVID um, response was pretty effective. I'm sure we'll find that there was more fraud than the Treasury would ideally like to have wanted in the schemes, but nonetheless they were devised remarkably quickly and broadly speaking did the job, I think. Um, and he takes the view that, you know, the death of the Treasury uh, is very much uh, exaggerated. And he speaks to someone from outside the Treasury who's come into it, but for a number of years. Uh, uh, he thinks that uh, the people who have forecast the death of the Treasury are right uh, off uh, piece. Um, there's an interesting piece by Lionel Barber in Prospect a couple of years ago, which I think is about as wrong-headed as a piece can reasonably be and passed through the rigorous editing process of Prospect, which basically said the Treasury has lost its authority, lost its status. I simply don't believe that. Uh, and indeed, 
Uh, George, in an interesting uh, discussion that we had as part of the book, I'm not sure, yes, I think I used part of this comment, but had pointed out that there weren't many institutions that had retained authority in this country, that quite a number, and of course we've seen, sadly, the Foreign Office has gone even worse in the last couple of weeks, um, that have lost authority, whereas the Treasury uh, has retained it. But I nonetheless conclude that I am quite anxious about it, because it seems to me that you can only stretch this elastic so far. It's all very well for it to be 8.4, but quite soon it might be 15.4 times um, the average house price times the treasury salary at a grade seven level, and can that really be sustainable? And I ask myself, if we are drifting into a kind of US model um, without explicitly deciding to, in other words, as we all know, that US public officials are paid uh, considerably less um, than anything that they could do in the private sector, but they come in and out, and that's how, it, that's how the system works. And are we drifting into a model where we are not paying our public officials, and particularly in the Treasury, a level which allows them to live in a decent way in London, um, and yet without deciding that that's a different model that we want, a mixture of political, external appointees, and some... Um, you know, uh, oiks uh, down below uh, who do the mechanics. And I think we're getting to that point, but we haven't decided it. If we had a debate about it and said that's what we want to do, well, fine. But at the moment, I think we're drifting towards that without making a clear decision. So those were the four points I wanted to, uh, to pull out and um, happy to take the discussion whether it wishes to go. Thank you. I would just say as a point of literary information, that possibly recent times have, have people have found the Treasury a bit more inspirational. Because if you think that actually that one of the Bond girls, in fact, the Bond girl in Casino Royale, see, I see Claire Lombardelli is nodding, as a role model, Eva Green, uh, was in fact a Treasury liaison officer, I think. <laughs> She's from the spending team, exactly. <laughs> and of course, my former colleague, Robert Peston, has written a book about which the, the, the crux of the thriller yeah. is the tax treatment of yeah. corporate dividends. I was talking about literature. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you look up Michel Houellebecq, he's not most famous for his commentary on the finance ministries, but anyway, that's a whole yeah. other thing. George. Mm. Uh, well, thank, thanks very much for inviting me back um, to Westminster. But actually, it's the first time I've been to uh, the Resolution Foundation. And I should say, although you were a regular thorn in my side, uh, you uh, often did so with um, being incredibly well-informed, which was quite annoying. Um, and <laughs> and so I, I, it's an opportunity for me to just thank you for all the work uh, the Resolution Foundation has done since it was created about 12 years ago. And I think it's an excellent addition. Uh, to the landscape uh, here. Um, and uh, second, the, the reason, much as I love seeing you all, indeed see some uh, former Treasury officials I worked uh, very closely with, uh, the reason I, I wanted to come along today was um, uh, one of the sort of big ideas I had on becoming Chancellor was actually inspired by um, Howard's first book um, on the Chancellors, which was a collection, as he said, of... Um, LSE lectures. And I was reading uh, that as Shadow Chancellor. I had the uh, distinction of being the longest serving Shadow Chancellor in British history, um, which is not actually a job you want for an incredibly long period of time. But I had a long time to think about being Chancellor. And uh, in, the, in one of the lectures, Dennis Healy, um, who I only briefly met once, and I, he put me down with a crushing comment where I was at the time Shadow Chancellor, he says, I think I was Shadow Chancellor once, but I can't remember. And I, I thought I'd really achieved it at that point. Um, anyway, in his, in his lecture, which is reproduced in Howard's first book in this area, um, he, he, he kind of regrets, he, he says that his credibility as Chancellor in the 70s was um, undermined, consistently undermined, by um, the inaccuracy of his Treasury forecasts. His, particularly his fiscal forecast, that he would produce these forecasts at budgets and they were always wrong. And, uh, and you know, it wasn't really his fault. Uh, the Treasury, that forecasting is not an exact science, you know, and you're only coming up with a sort of central 
estimate in, in a wide, and despite attempts by the Treasury to produce sort of fan charts and the like, people held you to, well, does GDP do this in the next year? Does, uh, you know, are the VAT receipts this in the next 12 months? And, and he said that this had caused him a lot of angst. And I observed as Shadow Chancellor, and I used to make political capital out of it, that that was true of the chancellors I was up against. I was Shadow Chancellor against Gordon Brown and Alistair Darling. And, you know, they were often under pressure towards the end of that period of that Labour government because their forecasts were wrong. And although other people have been doing some thinking in this space, it certainly cemented in my mind the idea that we could create an independent forecasting authority in the fiscal space. Um, and that this, although the Treasury would feel this was a loss of power and influence, in fact, it would also protect the Treasury um, and uh, preserve the credibility or help preserve the credibility of the ministers and the officials in the department. If we create an independent body, and it just so I didn't know when I was going to say these remarks that I've got both Charlie Bean and Robert Choate, who helped us create the Office for Budget Responsibility, which certainly in my mind, there's a direct link to the book that, um, that Howard produced. So I thought it would be um, paying my dues if I came along this evening and... Um, commented a bit on, on how it's but, but above all kind of get into a discussion. I would, I would just say, I want to say three things. Um, so the first is, if you read Howard's book, for all the criticism that's leveled, particularly, you know, I, I'm here speaking for the officials of the Treasury who don't often get a chance to speak themselves, although Nick was obviously an extremely good source <laughs> for your book. Um, if, you, uh, if, you, you know, if you read these the, the pages about uh, Gordon Brown's chancellorship, Alice Darling's, my own, Philip Hammond um, and um, uh, Rishi Sunak and indeed Sajid as well. The, you know, what, what strikes you is what a string of unbelievable sort of crises and events hits Britain. Um, financial crises, uh, the refer you know, referendum on Scottish independence, then Brexit, then COVID, uh, now you know, a war in, in, in Central Europe. And you know, the Treasury is the institution in government which basically has to come up with the answer to most of these problems. Now, hopefully under the leadership of a competent, on it prime minister, but nevertheless, it is the treasury and the treasury officials who have to do a lot of the work. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, yes, uh, you can kind of hold them to account for things like, you know, has productivity improved in the country and the like. But the truth is the institution is the functioning central department in government that, that works out how to rescue banks, how to, you know, deal with a pandemic, uh, how to deal with, uh, you know, a massive spike in oil prices and the like. Um, and, and that kind of adaptability is not to be underestimated because there aren't many private businesses, there aren't many government departments that could move as quickly as the Treasury moves to deal with one problem after another. Um, and that, I think it retains its its power and influence um, because it is so effective uh, and the people in it are effective. And yes, uh, I'll come on and say something about it, but you know, yes, that it's not as fully staffed as it might be. It's only around, a, I don't know, what the civil service has grown quite a bit since uh, I was chancellor, although I, I see there are plans to get it back to the level I left it. But um, you know, then the treasury had about a thousand officials in it and it, you know, it was not a huge institution by any means, but it's extremely adaptable. And I think that comes across in your book actually, you know, the, and it should be praised. I mean, second on the, um, some of the kind of questions you raise, Howard, let me just sort of um, pick up on, on, on some of them. I mean, this whole kind of separate department, I had no time for. The truth is, it's not like the Treasury has a huge number of levers. It's an illusion that the Chancellor sits there, or indeed like the, go the Governor of the Bank of England, or that these sort of central policy makers can pull some big lever on their desk and productivity improves or inflation automatically drops or you know the north of England does better it's it, it's an illusion that is sustained because we want to be in a world where people are in charge because I think that gives people comfort around the world when no one's in charge the people in charge want to claim they're in charge and the people who report on the people who are in charge want to claim that what they're reporting on is important so for all those reasons uh, you know, there's this sort of illusion that, you know, it's, it's a kind of you're steering a, a kind of well, uh, like, a, you know, a Ferrari motor car that will go left, right the moment you turn the steering wheel. 
It's not at all like that, as many people have observed before me. It's much, much more like kind of, you know, sitting on some slow moving super tanker and using the rear view mirror to see where you've where you're going. And I remember Nick saying to me in the very first few days uh, that I became chancellor that basically there are only two numbers that you can be absolutely sure of in the Treasury. Everything else is a forecast. Uh, and that is the amount of unemployment benefit you've paid out in the last week and the amount of taxes you've raised in the last week. And those are the only two real numbers. And everything else is basically a, uh, you know, a, a guesstimate. And there were periods of my chancellorship where, you know, the whole thing was based around GDP numbers being negative. And then a couple of years later, they oh, well, actually it turned out they were positive, but that made a big difference to the political environment uh, at the time. So I'm extremely skeptical that, uh, you know, a Department of Economic Affairs would somehow change the kind of dynamic and give the British state instruments to deal with perennial problems that, you know, have not been solved for sadly very good, not good in the good sense, but I mean, well-established structural reasons, such as the, uh, some of the weaknesses in the education system. So, um, so first of all, I'm, a, I'm, I'm certainly a skeptic of uh, kind of creating another government department in this space. On, the, on some of the other issues, on the, on the kind of referenda, I mean, obviously, a, you know, still a, a, a sore topic, uh, certainly for me. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the, um, the Treasury did an exceptionally good job in the Scottish referendum. And I, I, was, you know, I agree that Nick was a, was a very strong leader of the official Treasury at that time. I think um, Danny Alexander... Uh, and myself, uh, you know, used that material effectively. And by the way, the Treasury helped, dealt, dealt with the first coalition since the Second World War incredibly well as well. It should be pointed out, which is not easy to do inside the Treasury with two senior ministers from different parties. Um, but the reason why, you know, I think it worked in the Scottish referendum is because the essential issue came down to one, there was a lot of emotion in the, the Scottish referendum, but the question that couldn't be answered in the campaign was, uh, which, what currency are you going to be using the day after you vote for independence? You know, what is your, what, what's that, what's the pound in your pocket going to be worth? What is your mortgage going to be denominated in? What's your small business loan? And the, and the Scottish nationalists could not answer that question. And in, in a way, for all the um, weaknesses of referendums, and I was against having one on, on, on our EU membership, you know, it, the campaign did boil down to that question that couldn't be answered. And the truth is that in the Brexit referendum, you know, a lot of the polling suggested, uh, suggested this at the time and afterwards, the people voting for Brexit did not expect it to make them better off. That's not why they were voting for Brexit. They were voting for a, for a mix of motives, but around control and around immigration and control of the borders and, and the sort of link between sovereignty and that. And the, of course, the question that the Remain campaign, of which I was a central part, could not answer was not an economic one. It was you can't control the number of people coming into this country because you are a member of the EU and therefore you have signed up to free movement of people. And so every press conference we did on or, or event we did on the economics of Brexit, which were broadly accepted by the public, did not, were ultimately not on the central point. And just, you know, you can have a, you can have a good campaign or a good point in a campaign, even if the campaign is lost. As I often saw in politics, when campaigns win, everyone associated it with brilliant, the slogans were brilliant, the you know, Australian we brought in was brilliant, the computer was brilliant, and, you know, the message was brilliant, the manifesto was brilliant, and then when you lose, everything's rubbish. But, some, of course, life's not like that. And I think, you know, if you look at the medium-term uh, forecast document produced by the Treasury, and you do highlight this, Howard, you know, of what would happen with Brexit to long-term GDP, it is pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Years later, it's, it's pretty spot-on, and it's very similar to the OBR's analysis, which the OBR's analysis, of course, has been officially accepted uh, as it always is, by the government at budget time. Um, on the, and the, so I would, you know, I would make um, that point. The third thing I'd just sort of pick up on then is, um, is uh, this, the issue of the kind of culture and can this treasury sustain and itself and so on. I, you know, I don't disagree with some of John Kingman's uh, concerns, and John was one of my you know, most able, most talented public officials, by the way, delivered all, all this talk of levelling up. We didn't need a department of levelling up. 
back then, we did the Manchester devolution deal out of the Treasury, led by John Kingman. Uh, and that set the um, precedent for uh, the other devolution deals around the country. Um, I certainly used to argue with Nick, and we, we had a kind of pretty good working relationship, which was he you know, ran the official side of the Treasury, and I, I wasn't really felt my job to get involved in that. But I said, you don't actually have to pay Treasury officials less than officials being paid in other departments. And so you don't have to wear that hair, you know, hair shirt. Um, I think the broader challenge of how do you, know, how do you pay um, public officials in a way that's going to allow them to buy a house in central London is a much harder one, which I don't think is specific to the Treasury. Um, but I would say this, you know, there is, and it's, uh, it's something that um, Howard alluded to, you know, I've worked in a number of different uh, places and institutions and sectors in my life, and I've, you know, my, certainly to my mind, an interesting, varied career. You know, the Treasury was a fantastic place to work. Uh, I enjoyed every single day. I really mean that, that I turned up there. Uh, some of the people I work with are here in this room, and I want to thank them again. I've thanked them before, but you know, they're brilliant, brilliant people who worked incredibly hard uh, for the country. And I, I just sort of end on this point. Don't mess with something that basically works. Right? There, there is an ethos in the Treasury. The Treasury's been around not since... William Gladstone created it, but actually, for you know, there's been a treasury since there was a kingdom. It's the central department of any state, uh, and it has a long history. It's very proud of that history. It has a strong ethos. It gets, you know, there may be a problem retaining people, but there's certainly not a problem getting people to apply to join the treasury where there is a huge graduate application uh, each year. People have great careers there, maybe just for a few years and then go off into the private sector, but they all retain something of the treasury man or treasury woman. And, and, and the officials who do dedicate their lives to it, I, th I think are part of that ethos. And there aren't many places left in the British state that have that ethos. Actually, the Bank of England is one of them. Uh, I know there's a kind of rivalry between the treasury and the Bank of England, but that's another institution that has a very strong identity. There are other more obscure bits of the British state like uh, MI6 that has that identity, uh, where again it's a hard life and we don't pay people particularly well to work there. But there are other bits of the state which have lost that identity and lost that ethos. So I'm all for kind of keeping, you know, asking all the questions Howard rightly asks, making sure we keep the Treasury, uh, you know, on its toes, asking whether it could be doing things better, asking whether the structure of government should be changed. But fundamentally, the country is in a much better place for having the Treasury than not having the Treasury. And so uh, we should keep it that way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just so there are lots of questions and you should all if those of you familiar with Slido, you can also vote up questions. And I'm quite uh, it says something about the audience that the question about hypothecation keeps getting voted to the top. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a question about hypothecation is probably heading our way. But I will just quickly come back just on something that George said to ask Howard. You didn't mention it in your remarks, but obviously you cover it in the book. The creation of the OBR, mm. you know, arguably did remove from the Treasury what the time felt like a pretty big part of their job. Um, and it had some advantages, not just for the chancellor but um for for others in government over time and it also potentially it sort of took some of the politics out of some of this analysis i wouldn't say completely but do you want to just say a couple of lines about whether you think that sort of was it removing that amount of power from the treasury do you think that affected how did that affect the institution or is it sort of surprisingly mm. was was able you yeah. could do it without affecting that ethos i think that um the two major institutional reforms, well, sort of two and a half, I suppose, were during this period were the Bank of England independence, the OBR, and then the sort of switch I mentioned about tax policy. Um, and actually, I think, uh, although I don't think the third one has been used effectively, but I didn't find in talking to people anybody who really regretted either of those two major changes, either Gordon's uh, change or George's change on the, on the OBR, um, and accepted that um, you know, an ex an, a degree of external uh, discipline was appropriate. Indeed, one or two people made the point from a Treasury's perspective is that 
you know, the Treasury was sufficiently close to the OBR, but also sufficiently close to the numbers and the analysis and the way of thinking, that it didn't seem like a constraint on the Treasury. What it seemed like was a constraint on number 10. And actually, Phil Hammond, I think, made this point most neatly in my conversations with him, you know, that because you had to kind of fix the figures at a certain point for the OBR then to go and crank its handle and do its work, then the late injection of a bright idea from the policy unit in number 10 was then rather more or less impossible. Uh, and that they, so the constraint were effectively transferred to, uh, to number 10. And therefore, that was regarded as a positively good thing. I mean, we have a very well-ordered government now, but imagine a situation where you had number 10 coming up with random ideas at the last moment. Imagine. Maybe our uh, stops that happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it should be said, well, I said at the beginning that it's always the Treasury's fault. Of course, that's the official line, is it's always the Treasury's fault. And that's an interesting question that the Treasury allows itself to be the scapegoat repeatedly through history, whether it's actually the source of all evil uh, or not. Um, I'm conscious that there's some very distinguished people in the audience, and indeed lots of other people in the audience, um, let me, who are not all distinguished, because I don't know who you are. I'm sorry, I'm just that. You know. So that's a question from one of them. <laughs> um, but the, some of the, a lot of them have been already mentioned by the speakers. That's how distinguished they are. But the, one of the questions that has been voted up, which responds directly to something you happen to mention, and I apologise because it's sort of more of a sort of direct thing to, mm. to George. But there isn't a question by Anonymous. Uh, in the end, we only remember chancellors because of their mistakes. David Cameron has disputed George Osborne's opposition to the 2016 referendum. If you felt so strongly about it, why didn't you threaten to resign and prove that tension between number 10 and 11 can deliver good outcomes? <laughs> well, I, I honestly don't think it would have uh, made any difference. I mean, the, um, because the party, the Conservative Party, was committed, you know, almost to a person to having a referendum. So I don't think my me departing would have stopped there being a referendum. Um, and by the way, the country was quite enthusiastic. And by the way, when the actual legislation was passed, the Labour Party voted for that referendum as well. So it had a huge majority in Parliament. Um, but if you personally thought it was a massive mistake? Well, I'd, yeah, but the relationship, I mean, you know, uh, Howard hasn't written a huge amount, you know, because that's not the title of the book, on the relationship with the Prime Minister. But I always thought... You know, chancellors, there were certain relationships that it was incumbent on a chancellor to try and get right. Um, and one of them was with the governor of the Bank of England. Um, and I, you know, arrived in a treasury, which you know, I'm not going over that, you know, where the, basically there was sort of no speaking relationship with the governor of the Bank of England, which I had to kind of try and fix. And there was also the relationship with 10 Downing Street. And the partnership I had with David Cameron, you know, which was very unusual politically, was partly based on the fact that we would have good discussions in private. He would bring me into decisions which were many chancellors wouldn't normally be brought into. Um, but of course, if we disagreed, you know, he was the prime minister. That was my end of the deal. And I respected that. And I would go along with the decision and fight for it tooth and nail in, in public, which, I, you know, on the referendum, I went out there, did everything I possibly could to get the result that I thought was the right one for the country. The question that is at the top of the question charts at the moment, and I will ask because I think it goes to one of the things that is very distinctive about the UK. It's not just that the Treasury is more powerful than maybe, or at least has a different structure and is more powerful in some ways than other ministries of finance. It's also the enormously centralised system of both t of taxes and of spending in the UK. And the, one, the question from uh, Jacob Reinaldson is, do you think there could be a case for HMT to hand over some of their powers to devolved administrations and local government? Because actually the devolution yes. deals only handed over a very small percentage yes. of spending and not tax raising by and large. Well, personally, um, I do. I mean, this isn't a strong theme of the book, but I mean, if you look back over a long period of time, um, what uh, happened, and this, I was involved in this and I was at the, uh, at the Audit Commission, that Mrs Thatcher's policy was to get local authorities to raise a larger percentage of their uh, expenditure in their own income. That was her policy. And she managed through to 19, the late 80s to raise the proportion from, from memory about 48 to about 59%. Um, and uh, this was because she had a strong belief 
that if you that local government if it was voting on spending but not on the taxing because too much of the taxing came in the form of centralized grant you know this was not a good form of democracy and i think as a matter of principle that's a that's a good point and then of course uh the uh community charge as we were supposed to call it came in and that of course was a feeble tax base you simply couldn't introduce a poll tax at as high a level as the which allowed you to raise the same amount of revenue as the rates have done because it simply was too fragile a basis um, and therefore uh, the, when the community charge came in it only survived as we know for a couple of years and had to, to be uh, replaced by the council tax and by a very significant increase in VAT and all the progress that had been made through the 80s by a conservative government in writing this balance somewhat between taxing and spending in local areas was, was destroyed at a stroke by the poll tax. Um, and since then, you know, nobody has really been able to deal with it because the council tax is also a fragile basis because it hasn't been revalued forever um, and you simply can't, it isn't the strong enough basis to raise more money. Now, I mean, this is, goes well beyond the book, but I used to argue when I was at the Audit Commission, I did some papers on this for the government, which nobody paid any attention to, fine, then since abolished the Audit Commission, of course, a really genius idea, um, was that, you know, you should find other ways of, ta of allowing local authorities to raise their own funds. I mean, I thought, for example, you should devolve uh, vehicle excise duty. I mean, it's rational to charge a radically different rate in Westminster from in uh, South Devon where people absolutely need their cars, public transport's very poor, but in Westminster, you know, you charge a thousand quid. I mean, it probably the population would bear it. Hardly anybody working in an ordinary job in Westminster has a car parked here. So it seems to me there are things you could do to create more revenue. But what I'm not a huge fan of, and you, you know, as an old treasury hand myself, is just handing over responsibility, more responsibility for spending to other people without giving them any obligation to justify the tax raising. And so I don't like that sort of devolution, just hand over huge chunks of money, say, spend it as you wish. As long as you're trying to also increase their control over business rates and, and other taxes, then I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, um, yeah, briefly, I mean, I think you could go quite a lot further here. I mean, if I had had longer as Chancellor... Well, so do you wish you did more? Yeah, well, I, well, I think, you know, I, there were other preoccupations sort of early on in the, my period as Chancellor, but towards the end, you know, I turned my attention to the Northern Powerhouse and what <coughs> is an initiative for creating powerful elected mayors in these city regions. Um, and, you know, it was a bit of a sort of toe in the water. And I think if I'd had longer there another couple of years, I, I was certainly intending to do more on devolving some tax powers to those authorities. We have, you know, we did, and it took a huge amount of work by the Treasury, and it sort of got a bit underreported, but we've certainly here south of the border. But in Scotland, we have devolved income tax raising powers to Scots, the Scottish government. And, mm. you know, I'm not an expert on Scottish politics, and, uh, you know, I only observe it from a distance now. But, you know, I think it has thrown more pressure on the Scottish nationalist government mm. to kind of defend what it does and spend the money it does. Mm. And I think the argument England's not giving us enough doesn't kind of fly in the same way. So I think you can do that. But I think, you know, the Treasury, it, it'll be against the instincts of the Treasury because the Treasury says, yeah, but they'll screw it up and then we'll have to bail them out. And I think you have to, you can, you can go along with arrangements that aren't always going to work for the next hundred years. And they, but they, they'll still work most of the time. And that's not a bad thing. And I actually thought the government was wrong when TFL essentially went bust recently. The, you know, I know what I was thinking. The former mayor of London said, well, the current mayor of London, you know, should not have frozen fares, which is probably true. But there was also a COVID pandemic that meant no one was using the tube. Mm. And the government's response mm. was to suddenly start running TfL again and saying, well, you, you should be running this night tube and you should have the summer trains on the Bakerloo line. and whatever. Now, the, the government should have backed off and said, like, let's refix this devolution settlement that allows the mayor of London to run TfL and make mistakes and be held to account at the ballot box for those uh, mistakes. Um, 
So yeah, I, th I definitely think, you know, I think an exciting, if you're going to make it, you know, leveling up, if it's just going to be like, let's start up the town center and plant some pansies in the roundabout in the middle of, you know, some <laughs> northern industrial town is not going to fly. If it's actually, let's seriously try and create proper economic conglomerates, uh, you know, conglomerations, let's give these elected local authorities, elected mayors, real powers, let's take some bold taxes like, you know, have a fair income tax and say you can have an income tax surcharge or a corporation tax surcharge or, sub or, or deduction in your area, then you've started to have some real levers. And look, by the way, the politics at the moment is all inflation. It's about to be recession or something like recession. And then by the time we get to the general election, it's all going to be about recovery. And so if you wanted to kind of get ahead of all this and think, you know, if you were the current shadow chancellor, you'd be thinking, Stop worrying about today's thing. Where am I going to be in 2023, 24? And I would be, what can I give? What can I offer to the mm. you know, non southeast regions of London that gives them real powers to drive an economic recovery? And then if I was a smart government, I would get there first. Because just to be clear, because you actually, there was a theory that went with the devolution deals that involved about the power, you know, the yes. responsibility that came with being mayors and also some of the spending power. Um, just to be clear, the nothing that's happened on the levelling up front has, bears any relation to that. It's not consistent with that approach at all. Well, I, you know, I, Still I, I, I'm totally um, central power. Over. Well, I, you know, I actually think Michael Gove, Neil O'Brien, you know, ministers I enjoyed working with, both of them, are, tr are def definitely trying to do the right thing and push in the direction of greater powers for local areas. And, and the white paper wasn't bad at all. Um, all I would say is, maybe it's going back to sort of Howard's book, it actually needs the Treasury, the power of the Treasury, to say, this is what we're doing. Otherwise, it all gets lost in Whitehall with the Education Department saying, well, we're not, you know, we're not involving skills, and the Transport Department saying, well, you know, this is the way it's always been done. And so, you, you know, so you kind of need, the, the Treasury needs to get behind evolution for it to work, and for a brief period... Uh, towards the end of my time as Chancellor, it did get behind devolution and uh, made some significant changes. All right, we, we have basically run out of time, but I think there's a, there's a lot of questions and there's also, you know, we have got this audience. Um, any one question That's from the audience? Uh, well, so are you, you're going to write the yeah, hypothecation? Okay, all right, so, well, because yours has been sitting there, ask the hypothecation question. Obviously. If you just wait for a mic for the people mm. at home. William Clexton Smith, uh, I happen to agree with the Treasury that hypothecation isn't a good thing, but there seems to be more and more pressure from politics and the media to every time someone wants to spend money, say where it's going to come from, and effective hypothecation does seem to be creeping into the system. Do you think this is a good thing? What well, I, I don't, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got a no, kind of saying, central... <laughs> I think there was there was a young David Willits who once told me that um, you know one of the un, un sort of written stories of British politics or history is demographics, and I remember him explaining to me this 15 years ago or more that you know one of those in the 1980s there's a sort of cohort of young adults who come through who basically increase the tax raising base of the country, and that's sort of one of the stories of how the Thatcher government is able to pay for everything. Um, and we, alongside North Sea Oil, a crucial moment. Um, and we've got a problem at the moment, which is, you know, we've got an aging population, not as much as some European countries, but we've got an aging population, so more and more demands for expenditure on pensions, national health service, social care, and a shrinking tax base to pay for it. And you might have noticed, you know, I thought uh, it, with things like the row over national insurance, well, I actually thought the Chancellor did the right thing in a very difficult circumstance of proceeding with that national insurance raise to, because, you know, you've got to bring the money in as Chancellor. Um, the reason why you get, you're going to get into this hypothecation debate is it's easier to sell these tax rises, or some of them, if they're linked to things. Um, so I didn't do many of these, but I did, like, when we introduced a sugar tax, which I was very worried about, but by the way, it was a kind of great example of creative treasury thinking treasury officials doing more on the obesity agenda than uh, you know lots of other bits of government have done um 
but you know, and very much saying I'm very proud of having kind of announced, but I remember thinking, sitting there going, my God, we're going to put a tax on Coca-Cola. This could go pretty badly wrong. Um, and, you know, so there we said we're hypothesis, you know, the revenues are going to be spent not on general tax or general expenditure, but on school sport and things like that. And it was, you know, it was required to kind of get the get the ship down the slipway into the water. <laughs> a bit of hypothecation. The great thing about hypothecation is that actually people quite rapidly forget. And so the Treasury, after a few years, sort of, you know, starts its three-card trick and you don't quite go In the case of the social care levy, they immediately said it wouldn't actually be for social care. Yes, yeah, well, because it was called the NHS and social care levy, the <laughs> crucial bit being the first half of that sentence. But if you look at the connection that is made in the public eye between the windfall profits tax and support, yeah. why does there need to be that connection? Well, because I think, you know, politically... And the politics is not a bad word. A, we live in a democracy, and B, it's just a term we use to how we arbitrate our differences and come to some kind of collective agreement. You know, it's a way of explaining that I am able to help people with these checks in the post, essentially, by taxing the oil companies, and that's how I kind of make the sums up. You know, you, from a treasury point of view, um, I would say you know the the kind of the kind of consistency in the treasury has actually been, certainly in the modern era, has been, has been sort of fiscal responsibility. You know, that is what Alastair Darling is fighting for, if you read the, the stuff in the book on him. You know, he is the one arguing inside the Brown government towards the end of a, you know, as an election's looming, we've got to explain how we're going to make things add up. He's proposing in private things like a VAT increase, you know, and stuff like that. Then there's, you know, period I'm there, where we make it a kind of a, the central policy of the Treasury. Philip Hammond, as Chancellor, is also arguing, I've got to raise taxes. And the things he's forced to retreat on, uh, things like t taxing the self-employed, is because he's trying to, you know, he's doing, trying to do the right thing and make the sums add up. And, and, and of course, Rishi Sunak's just done the um, national insurance rise to pay for the pay for the pandemic, you know, or pay, pay for increased NHS and social care spending. So I would say the kind of fiscal orthodoxy, if you wanted the kind of, what, what cut through the, you know, what's the sort of beating heart of the treasury is actually fiscal orthodoxy. And I would say that's kind of broadly kept Britain in not a bad place over the last 30 years under different administrations, Labour, Conservative and Coalition. Um, and and, it, and is you can fashion into a popular political message. So the hypothecation, I would say, is, is you're linking the spending with the means of raising the money for it. And that's why it's a political device. But at least you're trying to raise the money. This is a very quick question at the back, because you did get your hand up first, but I'm conscious that we've run out of time. No, sorry, just behind you, he's had his hand um, up for a long yeah, time. Yeah, I'm Tim Lancaster. I worked in the Treasury in the 70s and 80s, and I was Mrs. Thatcher's private economic secretary. Um, Howard, you, you, you talked about the Ministry of Economy. Um, splitting up. I agree that completely pointless. The Treasury is as good and probably better than any institution in this country in dealing with the supply side. Um, but you didn't mention the possibility of a Bureau of the Budget. And it struck me when I worked on public spending um, that Prime Ministers, including Mrs. Thatcher, did not get involved sufficiently in, in strategic decisions on public spending. And I think that you could say the same of several other prime ministers. And uh, I worked in Washington and I was impressed by the Bureau of the Budget option. But maybe you could comment on that. But one other thing you didn't comment on is the fact that the Treasury's role was severely diminished in 1997 when monetary policy went over to the, the Bank of England. Um, I worked with, Dave, with David and uh, uh, Rachel Lomax and many others on monetary policy in the mid-80s. and it, that, was the, that was the beating heart of the Treasury. And monetary policy was the place to be. And uh, it was a very exciting place to be. Now, handing over monetary policy to the Bank of England took the politics out of interest rate setting, which was great. Um, and also, um, it went along with the idea that fiscal policy was no longer a tool of stabilization. And things have changed a bit since then. Fiscal policy has come back into the Treasury as a stabilization role. And what I think is a disadvantage now is that we don't have coordination. We used to have pretty good coordination between fiscal and monetary back in the, back in the 80s. We don't have that anymore. And you could see this last week with a decision on uh, 
on, 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 uh, on, on cost of living. Clearly, there, uh, in, interest I think rate you had, there was a question, but it was kind of buried at the beginning yep. rather yeah. than the end, wasn't it? I think there were two. Right. And uh, <laughs> thanks for that, Tim. I mean, I, I think on the first, I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't find anybody particularly interested in the idea of a separate OMB. Um, I mean, I think what may have happened over time is that the the chief secretary function, and of course the chief secretary has been somewhat devalued, hasn't it, and as a cabinet seat. I think the chief secretary now just attends cabinet rather than actually being a full member. Uh, and, and, and my recollection, you know, was that there were times when the chief secretary, um, you know, really ran his own empire. I mean, in the sort of Joel Barnett days, you know, chief secretary was a frightfully important fellow with a sort of policy uh, orientation of his own. But I didn't find much interest in separating that out. As for the monetary policy change, um, I uh, was in the, treas in the bank as deputy governor and was sort of in charge of orchestrating the monetary policy process when this change was made. And um, I think that by that time, you know, the Treasury was totally reconciled to this, really, because we'd got into a position with the Ken and Eddie show, which was really the worst of all worlds, actually, where the, the bank published its advice um, and um, the Treasury, uh, the Chancellor could, could disregard it. And I tell a story in the book about the, the meetings just before the 97 election, where we went along and there was a whole process in the, in the bank, very, very detailed analysis, carefully explaining why we thought rates should rise by a quarter or a half or whatever. Um, and, you know, we went in and presented this and Ken just sort of cut off the discussion before you'd even started, saying, well, it's obvious we're not going to raise rates this month, can't possibly do that, can I? Um, and then we had a debate about how long we should stay in the meeting in order to have the right length so that it didn't look as if the meeting had just not really had a discussion. So the debate was how long should we go? So, so what did waiting you then press. talk about? Did you talk about oh, we, did, we talked TV about whether, whether it would be appropriate to stay for 20 minutes or half an hour and how that would be interpreted. <laughs> um, I mean, and the whole thing was a charade and a nonsensical charade and, and it was embarrassing to be part of it, actually. So I think by that time, you know, the view was, look, you know, this has just got to be corrected. However, on your final point, just very briefly, I do think you've got a point. And indeed, this, uh, Ed Balls has uh, come up with some quite interesting ideas about fiscal and monetary coordination. He wrote a rather interesting paper at Harvard about the, about the sort of rethinking central bank independence, if you like. Uh, where he does argue for more uh, a, a coordination mechanism between fiscal and monetary policy. And although I suspect George probably won't get by this idea, but I personally um, think there's something in it, actually. Well, I, I thought, um, very interesting observations. Uh, the, um, I mean, it's interesting. I, I think a much more, much more common model you come across abroad is not a Department of Economic Affairs and a Treasury, but actually a budget office yeah. and a Treasury. So for some reason in Britain, it's all the sort of George Brown world where you have to create this Department of Economic Affairs. Um, and I think, you know, a stronger, a strong, what I think what's tended to happen is the very strong prime ministers have had very, you know, have had um, strong prime ministers, uh, strong chancellors and have kind of, but, you know, a, there's no reason why a strong prime minister can't get control of public spending. They do actually have the tools to do it. And they ultimately are the arbitrators. And they often have to overrule chancellors on, on spending. So it's partly kind of capability in, in, in number 10. I don't mean by creating some new department. You just need one or two people who've been in the Treasury, who've seen the scorecard and know what the Treasury are likely to be up to. Um, and that, that, you know, a lot of the last couple of prime ministers have decided they didn't want Treasury folk in the number 10. Well, you know, good luck to them. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think you you could, you know, you don't need to reorder government. You just your prime minister needs to assert themselves and understand. You know, they're alongside day-to-day -day spending. The, you know, to deal with this ex emergency or whatever. You know, the long-term trends of the administration are important. Um, on the monetary policy, so I, I kind of disagree. I mean, I felt I had pretty good coordination on monetary policy. It wasn't formal at all. I and mean, I had two governors, Mervyn King, who I you know was very much. 
I was the new chancellor. He'd been governor for many years. Um, and then Mark Carney, who was my appointment. But in both cases, you know, we did a pretty explicit job at explaining what our budget was going to be, what the fiscal policy was going to be, therefore what the monetary response could be. And I thought that was very grown up. And because the, both of them were very self-confident individuals and independence had happened, you know, over a decade before, there wasn't some sort of prickliness about the independence of the bank in this space. And I, you know, and I, I felt there was a pretty explicit coordination that they could go very loose on monetary policy because we were being tighter on fiscal policy. I think in the intervening, you know, there's an interesting test coming for the Bank of England, and I, you know, I have a lot of respect for Andrew Bailey and the team there. This is the first time since independence that we are in the kind of classic territory of a central bank having to raise rates into a recession. You know, it, it, I know there were one or two kind of moments like at the turn of the turn of the century when there might have been a recession, and the, but basically where the bank has had to get involved in things like um, the, the financial crisis, right, and, and quantitative easing, it's actually done it with kind of the authority of the Treasury and in kind of not always agreeing, but nevertheless having to work together. This is the first time that these are their decisions and they're going to be, you know, potentially very unpopular. And it's a proper test of kind of bank independence. It's a moment. Hmm? It's a moment. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. And, um, and I think it's actually in the bank's interests as well as the Treasury's to be making it clear that there's not two economic policies being operated in the country, but one. And I felt always as Chancellor that it helped me a lot that the Governor of the Bank of England had my back and I had his. Um, and that created the sense that the British state had a single economic policy. And even in this latest round, you could argue that the action to cushion, whatever you think about the actual action, the, the action to cushion household incomes of the direct impact of, of the high inflation actually gives more room for manoeuvre to the Bank of England. So it's not an obvious example of a conflict. But to be discussed over the mm -hmm. business meeting, um, which work will event. follow, sorry, work, work event, event. Uh, <laughs> that will follow this event. I'm sorry, yeah, we have had, we've got lots of questions, which I, you can look on Slido and see these fantastic questions and then bring them to um, <laughs> the speakers afterwards. I should, though, because uh, Howard very politely pointed out that if you had read your invitation, you came to the launch of a book that actually came out in 2006. Yes. Um, so the actual book that's just been launched is The Chancellor's Steering the British Economy in Crisis Years, not The Chancellor's Tales. Although well, I'm sure you'd be fine to buy both from Amazon <laughs> yes. if you wanted to. Um, thank you very much uh, to Howard and George.